Hello. In this segment, we're going to be dealing with the immutability of God. Oh, it's easy for you to say. The unchangeability of God. And as we're going to see, there's a sense in which this is the most foundational of all God's attributes. And um, it's, uh, it's hot here in North Carolina, so that's why I'm dressed. Um, let's begin uh, discussing this vital trait of our living God that he's unchangeable by quoting from Malachi. For the Lord does not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And then from James chapter 1. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Our focus in this segment is on God's immutability or his unchangeability. Um, he experiences no mutations or change. The being, nature, and eternal purposes of God do not change. Indeed, they cannot change. While everything we experience in this world is subject to change or mutation or evolving in some sense, God is not. He is the ultimate anti-evolutionist. He doesn't evolve. Nothing in our experience is analogous to this trait of God. If you think about it, take a moment. Everything in our lives changes. Especially in this fallen world in which everything is bent in some way. If we ever put up an either or in any situation, it must be either perfect or nothing. We'll always get nothing. So there's nothing perfect in this world. And there's certainly nothing unchanging. So, as humans, we are growing or diminishing constantly in our weight, sanctification, knowledge, strength, etc. However, all of the traits of God we have mentioned so far and will continue to are, in a sense, stabilized by the fact that God never needs or experiences augmentation or diminishment of any kind. His holiness, his love, his omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence are the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. And because God is immutable, that means that his promises are immutable and an anchor for our souls, protecting us from being consumed. And I think that may be the reason why it adds that on the the end of Malachi, where it says that God is unchanging, therefore you are not consumed. I've often wondered why it was there, but uh, I think it's because of the fact that since God is unchanging, that means that we have confidence that his covenantal promises will never be broken. Um, so... I think that's what's going on there. It ensures that God will always be the same in, in every respect. Some of the ways that God has dealt with us in the flow of redemption um, have changed, you know, from Old Testament to New Testament, you know, like the change in dietary laws. It's not like he was changing a mistake. It was a change in the way in which he dealt with 
um, some of the minor details of, of how uh, each of the covenants was to be um, uh, administered. And um, but he's not correcting mistakes or, or anything like that. Um, rather, he sovereignly chooses to change the outward signs of each covenant. And he does change in how re he responds to our situations. He grieves or he's pleased. So I say that because immutability uh, does not mean that he's a divine stoic or a celestial rock. Okay? But in James, it speaks of God as not having a shadow, which is kind of curious. Um, and it's a shadow which, uh, you know, doesn't vary and change. Uh, there's no shadow in God, I think, because he does not change. The refulgence of his glory is so blazing, the light, it precludes the presence of any shadows. Because, see, shadows indicate darkness. And in biblical categories, darkness indicates evil. Um, I couldn't help but think of this when um, this came up because in my dealings with demonic infestations, I discovered that perhaps the most common manifestation of the demonic is what is often called shadow people. I've seen my share of these unclean spirits, and I have a holy hatred of them. Normally they dart around, or uh, you see them out of the corner of your eye, but sometimes they do linger near people, near their beds, in various guises and poses, sometimes with a hat, called the hat man or whatever. But to me, the fact that these demons are posing as darkness is like perfectly appropriate physical manifestation of what pure evil will look like. Being pure evil, they are devoid of any divine light of holiness. And so being, so being darkness, visible darkness seems to be a very appropriate very appropriate for their spiritual condition, shadow figures. They are spiritual darkness. Um, so again, I think it's appropriate. But you have to remember that we were not in darkness, but the Bible says that we were darkness when we were outside of Christ. And I want to mention also that these shadow people are demons, period. There's no question at all. But the Most High God is holy, holy, holy. And there is no hint of darkness in Him. Instead, only holy and perfect in all His divine attributes. He does not cast a shadow because He is spirit. But more importantly, he is morally perfect. He is immutable and immutable, immutably perfect light. Um, God's immutability is not to be confused with immobility or being static. He is infinitely powerful and dynamic. Um, what Im immutability calls attention to is his internal consistency. God does not learn and his being or character is never augmented or diminished and his eternal sovereign decrees are immutable. Now in this uh, context of discussing God's uh, unchangeableness, I think it's appropriate to ask does God change by emptying himself? I mean, when Jesus emptied himself, is that an instance of uh, mutability 
Um, there have been several centuries in the history of the church in which the deity of Christ has come under very serious attack. The 3rd century, the 4th century, the 5th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, and now our own. And at the heart of this controversy is the so-called kenosis hymn in Philippians 2. Um, this kenosis, or kenosis is the Greek word for empty, um, that Christ experienced has occasioned great controversy. Let me read to you this hymn from Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but, here's a key word, emptied, kenosis, himself, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, 5 and 8. Now, of what did Christ empty himself? What changed? Does this threaten the truth of God's immutability? Starting in the 19th century, liberal theologians argued that Christ emptied himself not just of the outward glory of his divinity, but they argued that Christ emptied himself of some or all of his divine attributes when he became incarnate. That is, the immutable God changed, and God ceased being God, or at least fully God. A quick lesson in Christology, okay? Remember our discussion on, on the Trinity? We talked about how the Trinity was um, one in essence and three in persons. Well, in Christ, we have the opposite going on with the Trinity. In the Trinity, there is one essence and three persons, but the classical Orthodox teaching about Christ says that he is one person with two essences, a divine and human. He is simultaneously truly God and truly man. Now, what these heretical theologians are arguing is that the God-man voluntarily divested himself not just of his outward glory but of his omniscience, his omnipotence, and his omnipresence. This was necessary, they said, for him to truly identify with us. But we can see in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, where it talks about Jesus being able to sympathize with us as our great high priest, that he's able to truly be able to sympathize us with us without temporarily doing the impossible, that is, losing his deity. Touching his human nature, Jesus has experienced all the weakness and temptations that we do, but without sin. But in his incarnational humbling, he did not do what cannot be done, God ceasing to be God, the second person of the Holy Trinity ceasing to be God, while appearing as a nondescript poor Jewish carpenter, now rabbi, his human nature was perfectly joined to his divine nature, as all had and has all the traits of divinity. The outward glory was what was hidden and was displayed to some degree on the Mount of Transfiguration. But during most of his life, his deity was cloaked and concealed. But his deity was not gone or diminished 
in the least is godness was not gone. Dear friends, if Christ stopped being God for one second, the entire universe would have vaporized. Everything would have vaporized. God can't die. When he died, and this is a lesson in theology, and it may make you scratch your head, but when he died, his it was his human nature that died. And after he died, his divine nature was united to a corpse for three days. That's what classical theology teaches. Now, this canonicism or tendency to heretical emptying of Christ is very, very much alive and well today. Not only in liberal theology, but on Christian TV, where you hear guys in a well meaning way talk about how God laid aside his omnipotence or his omniscience or so forth instead of talking about how Christ in his human nature did not have omniscience. That's one thing to say that. But to say that God was not omnipotent, that's not, that's not good. Um, I, I, um, I had the honor of studying in seminary Systematic Theology under um, Dr. Robert Raymond, who has written perhaps the definitive treatment on this subject of kenoticism, the kenosis theory, and defending the full deity of Christ from the Old and New Testament. It's entitled The Divine Messiah by Robert Raymond. And like I said, I had a real honor of studying under some of the best theologians in the world at Covenant Seminary. And he was definitely one of them. And I remember his, his opening address uh, being um, uh, I, I see. Put in his um, new office, um, we call it. Um, uh, he was um, promoted, sorry, <laughs> to uh, full full professorship. And when in a convocation, you have a very um, detailed and. Um, in-depth theological discussion and um, <clears throat> I remember his opening words about and in this time there is a very real problem with canonicism and um, boy at that time in my life little did I know what he uh, he was on to and how much he was he was right so um, let's move on here and we see that um, another question that comes to mind is, did God change his mind? If God uh, is immutable, does that mean that he does not change his mind either? Well, it seems that he does, at least in some texts. In Exodus 32, 14, it says, And the Lord relented, or changed his mind, from the disaster he had spoken of bringing on his people. Now, this came after an impassioned plea and prayer that Moses had with the Lord. And there's a couple other texts similar to that. But, in addition to that text, 
you have these two verses. First one is from Numbers. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Numbers 23, 19. And also, um, and also, the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not man that he should have regret or change his mind. First Samuel fifteen twenty nine. Now, is this a contradiction in Holy Scripture? I mean, you know better than that. But how do we deal with this? Well. Don't have enough time to, to really dig into it as much detail as I'd like. So, if you have some questions, you can raise it in the question section on uh, YouTube. But I'll try to deal with it a little bit here. First, we must see Moses' pleading with Yahweh in terms of God's sovereign will. Remember our discussion in our last segment about how God uses means in his providence and how one of his main means in accomplishing his um, eternal plan is the prayers of his sons and daughters to which he personally replies to and that part of his eternal plan was that Moses would pray that prayer and have that effect on him. But I don't want to diminish the fact that Moses' prayer had the impact on God that it did. Um, in situations where we see God relenting or changing his mind, it's usually in contexts of intercession in the midst of impending judgment. Okay? Now, when you have the time, I'd like for you to look at, at Jeremiah 18, where we see that God lays out a paradigm for how to deal with threats of judgment or pre uh, predictions of judgment that God was threatening against his people. Because we see in this, in Jeremiah 18, that God's threats are generally to be seen as conditional. If the people repent, then God will relent. We see an example of that in Nineveh. This, is st this principle is, is stated explicitly in, in, Je in Jeremiah 18, where he, God talks about that. If evil people repent after I have uh, pronounce judgment on them, then I will relent. But if they do the opposite, then I will relent in the other way. So, as odd as it may sound, relenting or changing of God's mind in, in a certain sense is an aspect of God's gracious character. Relenting is, in a sense, an attribute of God. It's an aspect of God's gracious character in light of repentance in the face of judgment. Okay. It gets back to the fact that we saw that God is both transcendent and eminent. That is, uh, transcendent means he's above time and that all of his decrees are um, unbreakable, and um, but that he also exists very meaningfully in time and interacts very meaningfully in time within us. But his the ultimate decree and guiding force that leads everything in life is his eternal decree or foreordination. Um, what I was referring to in uh, Jeremiah, I'd like to read to you so you can get a gist of, of um, the principle I was talking about. 
The word of the Lord came to me, that's Jeremiah, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as a potter has done? Okay, there you have language of, strong language of the lordship theology going on, declares the Lord. Behold, like the, de like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster, or in Hebrew, change my mind, that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build up and plan it, and it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do it. That's from Jeremiah 18, 5-10. So, um, what we have here is a general principle that was built on the prior incident in Exodus, God's interaction with Moses. And we, we note that many of, um, well, I come back to that. There's a, um, many of the prophecies are, quote, conditional prophecies. And I don't mean to water down the authority of that, but that's exactly what Jeremiah is talking about. And they are, in a sense, conditional. God will judge them or not judge them, condition or based on their response. God does not delight in the, the destruction of the wicked. So with that understanding is that if it's not stated explicitly in most of the prophecies, there's a general implicit understanding that if the people who are being prophesied against repent, there's the understanding that, um, that God would relent of his judgment. Now, there's some... Um, uh, there are some... Um, there's some changes to that, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, there are some that are absolute, let me just put it that way, where no amount of um, repenting would have made a difference because the, the time had come. But for the most part, the, the, uh, the prophecies were determined by how the people uh, responded. And, and that's in line with God's gracious character. Now, another important thing to keep in mind, my friends, is that you'll notice that the discussion with Moses was in a um, historical narrative context. And that's why we must interpret historical narrative with the didactic texts to clarify it. One of the most basic rules of hermeneutics or sound um, interpretation is interpreting the historical narratives through the clear didactic teaching texts. And so the two texts that I mentioned to you about God not lying or repenting, those are didactic texts which um, give us teaching about the nature of God. Okay, so they should take interpretive priority in our understanding of the nature of God when it comes to uh, this situation. Uh, or we'll end up thinking that, you know, we can correct God. You know, Moses showed real holy boldness in the way that he wanted and in the way that he interacted with God. And that's what he wants from us is a holy boldness. But, you know, don't get it into your mind that, that um, you know, that we can 
give God information that he doesn't already have um, or give him a, him a motivation that he doesn't already have. That's blasphemous. Um, he wants us to pray in an impassioned way that brings his own promises before him in a sense reminding him of what he himself has said. But that's different from thinking that we're teaching God something. That's something you know, we can't do. Um, the bottom line, the point is, is that God wants us to pray. That's, that's the main message that I, I think is, is, is seen here. And as we talked about last night, prayer changes things. Okay. Now, lastly, there is a movement, um, process theology or God in process. And if you've if you've if you if you've heard the term middle knowledge, that's starting to get closer and closer to perilously close to. Um, process theology in evangelical circles because of some of the things that it implicates. Um, what process theology teaches is that there is a mutable God um, and this mutable God of modern theology um, is also pretty prevalent in preaching as well if you listen to some uh, a lot of the messages actually what we see is a finite God who is constantly mutating or changing and is technically called panentheism he uh, as opposed to a living God he may not be tomorrow what he is today that's the teaching of process theology, or God in process. They unabashedly attack immutability because they think it denies human libertarian freedom. But friends, in biblical theology, in the study of God's word, we start with the word of God as our presupposition and we don't build a theology based first on what we think is compatible with our views of God and human freedom. That's upside down. These guys start from man and a um, unbiblical view of human freedom and then try to fit God into a box that will supposedly um, then fit into the, their box of understanding of autonomous human freedom. So that's not the way biblical theology works. We start with the Word of God. We start with God. And then we let the Word speak for itself. And we let the Word shape our thinking. And you know, friends, we close our mouths when we face passages that we find troubling or humble us or challenge us. We close our mouths. And we listen. Because I know that we're going to come in, into contact with some, some teachings that are going to challenge us. But a God who is constantly changing is not worthy of our worship or trust. And it is God's precious immutability that safeguards all of his promises. In Hebrews 6, it talks about how it's such a lovely picture that it's an anchor for our soul 
that enters into the heavenly of heavenlies, the Sanctus, San, Sanctus Sanctorum of, of heaven, and an anchor for our soul is this knowledge that God's attributes are unchanging and his promises are unchanging. All of them, including, including Romans 8, 20, 8.28, and that God will not change. And in order to not have to deal with the holy God of the Bible, folks have tried to defang him to tame him but you know folks they, they can change their theology all they want all they can but one thing we can never do is actually change the unchangeable and that's God's immutability if there are changes to be made then they need to be made in us because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and forever, and forever. Amen.